Well, actually doing for so they can do baselining of buildings. Ooh, what a novel idea. We've got to know how much energy it uses. Are they in the mandate to do that? Or are they doing it so they're, they can? Uh, I, they're, if they qualify, they get money. So mandate, yeah. I would, so I'm to get right there. Cool. Uh, I would guess at least 50% of the people that either own or run buildings have no real idea how much energy it uses per square foot. They just have, it's been too cheap to bother with until the last couple of years. I'm sure it's higher than that. Would you say 50%? Yeah, but I actually think, from my experience, people who run rental space, like people who rent out offices and they pay the bills, they, they often have pretty good energy folks on board these days because part of their challenge for not going bankrupt is how do we... How do we com be competitive from an energy square foot usage perspective? My name is Kevin Connolly. Um, I grew up in Laconia, single family house, uh, about 1,800 square feet, pitched roof, uh, probably 70 years old, just about 70 years old. Um, like I said, I grew up in Laconia, lived in Europe for 20 years or so. Um, my primary background is um, finance and accounting, corporate accounting. Hmm. So I've worked for companies like uh, Amazon, Thomas Cook, and relatively large companies. And <clears throat> moved back about a year ago, and what I'm trying to do is diversify my knowledge, um, business background with this field right here. Uh, I'm not sure which uh, direction I'll take you in. Cool. Uh, no business model already developed or anything like that? No. Yeah. And I, Continues to happen, or somebody decides it was a partisan issue and plays games with it. Right. Eric Gillette from Belmont, grew up in a single family home, about 35 years old. Um, currently, I work at a restaurant. Uh, I got one more semester and then hoping to get a job in the field. Very open. Something to do with it. Something to do with energy. Well, thank you all. Did, did it, have any of you lived in buildings that in March water flowed through the basement? I think when I, when I was younger, we had some water issues. It's been fixed since, but... Yeah. And, and yours current or past? My parents' old house, old basement. Old farm ties, with rock wall basement or concrete? Concrete. Concrete. Okay. Um, my background is... A, I grew up in a Sunoco gas station in suburban Boston, and my expertise at 16 was brakes, so I got to breathe all the asbestos you could ever want to play in, and I rebuilt the fiberglass boat, so I got to breathe all that crap, too. Um, I ended up at Northeastern in mechanical engineering program and a co-op program, and ended up ultimately in a graduate program for air pollution control, water pollution control, and solid waste disposal. And while I was in that program, I met this crazy guy who was measuring carbon monoxide levels on hockey rinks and got to do some volunteer work for the Lung Association. And it turns out he was at Harvard School of Public Health. And he needed someone to make quiet air sampling pumps and equipment so he could measure pollution in people's homes. And I got hired to do that while I was in grad school because my co-op jobs had been building chemical metering pumps to do chlorination, fluorination, etc. So I never planned any of that. It just evolved. And I spent 10 years at Harvard. And while I was there working with a bunch of MDs trying to measure pollution in homes and offices and cars because we, we understood industry. We didn't understand a space like this. Um, that's when the first energy crisis hit and people shut off outside air because oil went from 19 cents a gallon to a buck a gallon. 
and created lots of problems. So I essentially developed a consulting group to, to look at what's wrong with your building, why are people complaining, how do we get it straightened out and get you flying right so you can have a productive situation in your building instead of a bunch of PO'd people that are not productive and thinking about suing you and complaining about their illness and all that. So, so the past 20 years I've run a group of uh, what's now six guys and one lady. We're all engineers or engineering types and one architect and our focus is healthy buildings and indoor air quality and sort of the latest thing is moisture management, building science. Why do buildings work? Why do they not work? How do they fail? How do you make them work again? How do you design them so they don't break, etc.? From my own personal experience, I've had hot water panels on my house since 81. I froze them once. Uh, it's got a 300 gallon soft tank in the basement, which I'd never do again. My garage has four panels on it, and it's a flywheel system with antifreeze, and it's worked flawlessly for 20 years. My barn has a solar system, a solar hot water system on that preheats a 400 gallon tank that then a geothermal heat pump takes energy out of the ground, runs it through the tank, warms it up a little to get COPs of five or better. And I'm about to put panels on a shed that's built out of four inches of foam, even though it looks like an old barn and use that to keep it above freezing because right now it's got a propane heater in it. Those panels are recycled copper panels that are probably 25 years old that somebody froze up once and I found a, a guy, I had 15 of them, I found a guy who, uh, the deal I made with him is you can take all 15 for 50 bucks a piece, you can bring me back four that work after you've rebuilt yours. So. They're due back this week. He's an auto mechanic at a body shop and real good at screwing aluminum together and taking things apart and making them work. So if you got any questions on indoor air or solar or anything like that, feel free to ask. I also, this year I took, I took out a $40,000 loan at a 4% interest rate and put a $60,000 PV system on the whole south side of my office in Maine to try to get to net zero as an office. And we didn't get to net zero until August when I started running all the equipment in a different way than it had historically ran. But August and September, we've been net positive power generation. And it's an engineering office with a plotter the size of that table that has a plug this big that you obviously have to turn off when it's not running or it drains power. Um, it has eight air heat exchangers in it. and. I'll answer any questions you want on any of these topics. Let's go through some slides. And this was set up as a webinar, um, originally developed from a whole long day training course. And we can cover all the principles that I think are useful to you. Anybody know what BPI training is? What's BPI training? It covers various aspects of, uh, how would you say it? Energy conservation, I'd say. Um, you know, you look at your blow door testing, you look at your infrared. So, BPI is you're going to change this house, don't screw it up. Don't kill somebody from what you do to it. Um, it's, so, this data has a lot of references to BPI. BPI is probably the best right now source of training for understanding residential sized buildings and how they work and don't work and how you can screw them up and uh, making changes to them. Commercial buildings actually get far more complicated because usually there's an architect of record, engineer of record, and usually they designed it to certain codes when it was built. And if you're going to change the way it works, you probably need to rethink what you're doing to the overall building. Houses pretty much are simpler boxes. So um, if you want more information than what we got today, Everything that we're doing today is posted on the main indoor air quality website. And if you want to follow along, you have handouts in front of you, right? Um, so that's the website. And you can go there, and you don't need any passwords to get in or anything. This under, the, if you do, I think it's recent, 
recent something, the whole six hour slides that are way more than what I'm gonna show you today are there and all the resource pages are there. So if you wanna learn about weatherization and changing buildings and indoor air quality, I don't know a better place to find it right now than that website and the data that's posted there. So, any of you ever been around a building that someone screwed up trying to make it better? What, Wes, what's the context of your... Um, I did an audit on a building where, this is quite a while ago, where the building was less than a year old and or a, a year from a renovation, and there was mold all over the place. <laughs> we're gonna look at one. Of, we're gonna look at one of those in the case study at the. Uh, at the I end. Mean, we went in the bathroom, and it was uh, around the, the perimeter in the basement, and it turned out that this woman had designed this house. She wanted a, a copy of a house that had been built on the Cape. And they had put no ventilation in the attic, and they had done the best they could to seal it up. They had put no ventilation in the whole structure, not just the attic. And um, it was uh, it was rotting from the inside out, and we um, we recommended that she get some ventilation in there. And she never did anything about. It? Not that I know of. Now, the the bottom line is you can if you're careful. You can build a home today with an unvented attic and unvented roof. You have to be careful and you have to know what you're doing. But the, the anomaly in this climate, do any of you understand what radiational cooling is? Black sky radiation at night when there's no clouds in the sky? It's when the heat just goes up into the atmosphere. Yeah, you got, let's assume it was what? Attic was 130 degrees in the daytime with the sun out. That is, anyone ever been in one of those? Yeah. Uh, let's assume the attic was 130 degrees in the daytime and the temperature goes down to, uh, I don't know, 40 degrees at night and it's September. Right? What happens to the, where does the air outside the roof go during the nighttime if it's a vented attic? The answer is into the attic. That's because the attic's vented, right? What's the surface temperature of that black roof or dark roof with a, it's minus 200 degrees up there and there's no clouds to stop radiation. What's the surface temperature of that black roof now that the sun's gone down, it's been gone for six hours, so the roof's getting cold? And the answer would be 40, maybe colder than 40. <clears throat> That air outside that's coming into that roof, if, it's, if the dew point temperature of that air is 50 degrees and it comes in the attic because the attic's vented and it's 40 degrees in the attic, that outside air at night just soaked that attic. The only reason our roofs don't rot off here with vented attics is usually the sun comes out on enough frequency that it drives all that moisture back out of the attic again. So there's lots of folks saying, hey, in some climates, if it, does, if it wasn't for snow, you could vent, you could not vent most attics if you built them right, and they'd stay drier than vented attics. The issue here is if an attic is warm and there's three feet of snow on the roof, <laughs> you get ice dams that are brutal. So we tend, in snow climates, we tend to build vented roofing systems so they're cold at night and preferably stay cold in the daytime so the snow doesn't melt and refreeze at the edge and make a nice dam and then flood the roof. So lots of people advocating unvented attics, built right, they can work. Um, so these slides in here have, have a lot of references to main codes and main laws. So you'd have to do your own research on New Hampshire. Um, the feds actually are about to come out with their own program, assuming it doesn't get canceled after last night. <laughs> with EPA and DOE actually got together and have agreed upon, you shouldn't make houses unhealthy when you make them more energy efficient. 
so EPA and India are about to release a bunch of guidelines for weatherization crews on how to not screw houses. Here's the protocol you shall follow to not mess up the houses, assuming that all doesn't get canceled. So let's talk about where New Hampshire and Maine. It ain't a dry place, right? Anyone ever been to Arizona or Colorado? I mean, out west, well, out west, you're just about finishing up right now fire season. What's fire season? Dry climate that dries out all the trees. That's when everything that's grown turns to crispy critters and you hit it with a lightning bolt and acres burn. And if you're really unlucky, houses burn. So we don't, we don't have to deal with that in Maine and New Hampshire. For the most part here, we worry about mud and wet basements. And why, is, why are the water companies here? Why is Poland Springs, why is an international company bought up tons of land in Maine to suck the water out of the gravel? The answer is, because there ain't any better place in the country to mine water than there is New England. New England's full of ground up gravel from glaciers that dumped it here and we get 60 inches of rain a year that fills up those aquifers that when you pump water out of gravel, you get this nice clean water with a little radon in it compared to the mud you get in the rest of the country. That said, when you stick a house on a foundation in Maine and New Hampshire, unless you work hard, the bottom of that house is going to be wet. Um, Arizona, I don't have to think about it. In Maine, New Hampshire, when I build a house, if I don't do something to make that basement or crawl space dry, it will be a wet, cold place. And we know now that wet, cold places are mold factories. Um, 1890s farmhouse that the rats and critters moved in and out of and the possums and, and uh, raccoons moved in and out of freely was so well ventilated it didn't matter if it was wet. But we don't build houses that way anymore. Um, so part of the challenge in New England is it's a wet place. You got a bunch of old houses around. You know, we settled, he settled he here a, a lot earlier before the, you know, Mormons took over Salt Lake City. And so you got a bunch of old houses with wet basements because no one really cared historically. Um, the minute I tighten up that house, I seal the attic up, I put new windows in it. Where's the air coming from now? The basement or crawl space. So the minute I tighten up an old house, more of the air I'm going to breathe is coming from the grungiest places in the house, the basement and crawl space. So lots of reason to be concerned about asthma, mold inhalation, toxic fume inhalation from mold, etc. Because when you weatherize a house, pretty much you move the air intake to the basement and crawl space. The only other exception is when it's got an attached garage. Now it becomes the air intake. Um, that's not to say don't do it, it's just to say be aware of all that as you do it. Um, New England has some of the highest radon levels on the earth. If it was valuable we could probably all retire because you could mine it and sell it. Unfortunately radon increases the risk of lung cancer. So there's all kinds of guidance now on yeah it's under your house but don't let it come in. And, and all kinds of good guidance on how to keep it out. Tell me about New Hampshire building codes. Maine just finally has a statewide building code. Has New Hampshire had one? We've had, a, a building, we've had an energy code since 1979. What about a building code? Building code we've had until 2002. It was by jurisdiction, by town by town. In 2000, I think in two, the state adopted a statewide building code, which is um, overseen by the Codes Review Board, Building Codes Review Board. Do you know which code they adopted? They is it adopted Internet IRC? For energy, it's the IRCC, and it's now been updated to 2009. What about for other than energy? 
Well, I think it's that for the fire code, it's the NF National Fire Code. The rest of them, I think, are ICC codes. Okay. The, the reason I ask is all the new IRC codes say if it's a wet climate, waterproof the basement. Pretty simple direction. Waterproof the basement means something other than the black goo you spread on the, the foundation for the lowest paid person at 10 bucks a can. Waterproofing is something that will bridge the cracks of concrete because concrete always cracks. And most waterproofing companies that spray on something that's real thick and gooey put something over it so the guy on the hoe doesn't destroy it with rocks or the hoe while you're backfilling either foam or fiberglass or something to protect it during the backfill operation. So you get an insulated and waterproof foundation. Can you do that from the inside? That's never what you do on, you'd never prefer, it's my opinion that you would never prefer to waterproof a basement from the inside if you have a, an option to waterproof it from the outside. You always want the damp proofing layer or waterproofing layer to be on the wettest side of the concrete, which in this climate is the outside. I'm just thinking energy retrofits. That's one of the issues with energy retrofits. Um, if the basement soaked, what can you do about it? what can you do that someone can afford. Um, I assume New Hampshire uses almost as much number two as Maine, but you got more gas lines in southern New Hampshire than Maine historically has had. So I, how many of you burn in something other than number two oil in your, wherever you live now? Just wood. Just wood. Pellets or? No. No, wood, wood. Um, so the other issue with New Hampshire and Maine is this thing called backdrafting. Can one of you guys tell me what backdrafting is? Not Wes? What's backdrafting? This is when the air comes low. For example, when the air comes down the chimney. When the chimney becomes the air intake for the house instead of the exhaust. And the classic issue historically is I got a gas fired hot water heater with a little three or four inch flue going out and I get a wood stove running on the other end of the house so the chimney that that gas thing goes to is cold. I turn on the gas unit, where does the fumes go? And the answer is into the basement because I got a cold chimney, especially if it's an outside wall chimney, I got a cold chimney with no heat in it. And air smart, when it's heavy and cold, it comes down. So the chimney becomes a makeup air and you can end up killing somebody if the CO burner is tuned bad enough in the hot water heater. So New England is a tough place to make houses work right if they aren't working right to begin with. All kinds of data right now that suggest moisture, mold, mites, mice, etc., and houses, vermin and mold, can exacerbate asthma, bronchitis, and allergies. There's some folks even think they can cause them. So lots of guidance today on don't have your house be a mold factory or mouse factory or roach factory or um, let it be taken over by rodents. You know, we, we thought a few years ago when a bunch of Native Americans were dying out west, it was because of some nasty chemical that someone was releasing by the military and it turns out it was the the hunter virus from mice taking over dwellings and that virus was killing people when you clean up the mouse poop. So, Cancer is classically an issue from radon. Um, probably breathing the urethane foam that makes up this two-part foam system prior to its curing is really bad for you also. We know it's a sensitizer uh, it's a suspected carcinogen. It's pretty nasty stuff. Once it's hardened, pretty um, innocuous stuff from what we know. Pretty durable stuff, mixed right. But there's the urea, the urea, from out, the urea, the urea, the isocyanurates that are in there before they're cured are really nasty materials that industry has all kinds of controls on, but someone can carry that out and use it in a house 
with no controls. It does say for professional use only on it. That means you're supposed to be trained, understand the MSDS sheets, know that without a respirator, the stuff in there can hurt you bad. Um, and we know that NO2 is not particularly good for you and formaldehyde is lower and lower levels are being governed in buildings. And we know carbon monoxide kills you because your blood sucks it up 200 times faster than oxygen. So in the presence of both, it's not the lack of oxygen that kills you. It's the fact that carbon monoxide is around and saturated your blood and you're dead. Any volunteer fire type people here? Okay. Firefighters historically die from CO poisoning. Prior to the air packs, the body count was from inhaling CO and it's sucking up all your hemoglobin and you die from CO poisoning even though there's plenty of oxygen around fueling the fire there's too much CO around so you can't breathe. So those are all the issues. If you look at actually data from from Maine Housing when they looked at complaints from weatherized homes or observations from people doing weatherization the amount of units with asthma or bronchitis uh, or mold or moisture problems just in, in weatherization programs already known were pretty high. You're talking 20% of the units having some kind of issue in them and maybe up to 80% having something to do with mold issues. So, moisture issues. A refresher, if I took this wonderful miracle inside here called my lungs and spread it out, how much surface area? And the answer is full-size tennis court. So the issue with me doing brake work at 16 is whatever I suck into my lungs is one cell width from my bloodstream. That's why people smoke and do dope and inhale funny things. It's essentially your lungs are an instant passage to the human bloodstream. It's both good and bad. It's great for administering drugs if you're an asthmatic. It's bad if you're a soldier and don't have a gas mask on when someone puts something nasty in the air or tries to get you with a biological organism that you inhale. And we know enough now to know that asbestos is a miracle fiber. <laughs> you can't get rid of it. It's indestructible. But that's what happens inside your lungs, too. It gets stuck there forever because it's like a needle. And the, we think the body ends up mutating because it's trying to chemically destroy the asbestos, and it can't. Same issue right now probably exists for carbon fibers that we're making all these golf clubs out of and bicycles out of, et cetera in its solid state, probably fine. Take a sanding belt sander to it or a grinder to it and probably just as bad as asbestos. Stay tuned for the laws that will be developed. Pretty much in this country, you can sell anything you want until someone proves it's nasty. The only way we have of testing stuff that's nasty is we have mice that don't have skin on them raised by the Jackson Lab and others and we brush them with chemicals to see what happens to the skin of the mouse. And we have the Ames test where you expose bacteria to something and see if the bacteria dry, die. We don't do experiments on humans. We used to use prisoners for that on a volunteer basis, but that's now illegal. So it's tough to know what's good and bad for you until after the fact. Tightening up a home is all kinds of issues you might create. Air sealing is, is likely going to increase humidity. That's good in the winter time in most houses. It may cause backdrafting. It may cause more air to come from the garage basement or crawl space, which we already discussed. Um, insulation. Insulation is wonderful for showing, slowing down the rate that heat leaves a building. That's what insulation is all about. However, if you got an old lath and plaster building and it has window leakage, so when we have a nor'easter, a little water gets into the wall, with nothing in there, wall dries out. Wind blows through, wall dries out. The minute I put insulation in there, I don't care if it's fiberglass, chopped fiberglass, blown cellulose, urea foam, some other kind of foam. The minute I put insulation in a wall, if that wall gets wet, 
There is no force to dry it out. Wes. Harry, you should talk to him, mention your... I have a brick house that we insulated a wall, or two walls in the dining room. And um, I guess I asked if it, what would be the best way to insulate it. And uh, it, uh, I was told to wait and see if, if I insulate it, maybe the, the water will escape and then it'll start kicking off some of the motor and stuff. I can tell you what the theory is. Is it three-tier brick, four-tier brick, brick veneer, rock, or what? Three-tier three brick. Three -tier brick. The, the theory in insulating masonry buildings is actually very simple. Do anything you can on the outside to keep wind-driven rain draining off the window sills. That's why old brick buildings have these big lentils above them and they have these architectural pretty brick arches that stick out a layer or half a layer so that any water running down hits that and runs off so keep wind driven rain out is the message don't do it by spraying it with the silicone stuff you put on your boots spray on waterproofing for masonry buildings usually is setting them up to freeze and thaw and blow apart because you want the moisture to freely come out and if I put a coating of some kind of moisture retarder on the outside, the wind driven rain pushes it in and it ain't coming back out easily. If the sun hits it, if the sun hits a surface, which way does it drive the moisture? If it's not a solid, if it's not steel or aluminum or vinyl, it's, it's shingles, clapboards, brick, hardy plank, whatever, and the sun hits that surface, where does it drive the moisture? Towards the cold side. Towards the cold side? Towards the cold side, which is in. So, number one, make, before you insulate a brick wall, make sure that the mortar's in great shape. It's, that it, that if I put a knife in it, it doesn't go in and doesn't fall out. And make sure I've got all the overhangs I can do it. If there's a window set in there, what you really want to do is take the window out, put in pan flashing that goes out over the edge so that any water that comes down goes out over the brick. Once you've done everything you can do to keep the brick from getting soaked inside, then you can think about what do I do for insulation? The very, and the answer is you can put some in but not too much because you still want some heat loss to drive moisture out. The schemes we've usually followed that have been successful so far. <laughs> and the, fo the person I know who knows the most about this is John Straub from Canada, where they've been doing this for years. You can put the equivalent of up to two inches of foam on the inside, usually not touching the brick. So that there's air space between the foam and the brick, so that any moisture that does get in actually has a place to go to, and so that probably in this climate there's enough waste heat going through the wall to drive moisture back out again under most conditions, especially when it's January, February, when the brick's going to be relatively porous and you're only going to have vapor in there and the heat loss from the building will push the moisture out through the pores of the brick. A brick a human lung is the size of a tennis court. In theory, if you took a brick, which is a solid porous object, and opened up the pore space, and it's the size of a football field, which is why bricks have been around for thousands and thousands of years, and they only fail when you lock water in them and freeze it. So that's the theory. Um, how, long have, how long ago did you do this? And what's, so it's, you've got brick, then what? Brick, it's just straight up brick, and then it was lath and plaster, and she took all the lath and plaster down. And put up? Put up a uh, foam board. With an airspace? Yeah. Uh, How thick a foam board? That's the... Inch and a half, two inches, three inch inches. And, uh, and then she... You should be okay. Now you got to make sure you... Do everything you can to keep wind-driven rain out. 
and you need to take a careful look at the outside and make sure the mortar isn't already yeah. dead. I did that already and it's, it's still fine. So, so if, if you really want to know what's going on and you got 150 bucks or Wes can come up with it for you, drill a hole in the wall and bury an RH temperature data logger probe in the wall and watch it. Because um, you can buy a hole, because there's lots of people wanting to do what you're doing and not a lot published about it in this country. Um, if you told me you put squirt foam right on it, I'd be going, Urgh. then you have a hell of an experiment, but rigid foam is okay. If you were willing to sacrifice the space, you probably could have just left the lath and plaster there and put foam on the inside. But then you risk having wood in a place where it could get wet and grow stuff. So taking it out is probably better than leaving it there. No studs? No, they're on the, they're on the wall. So the three bricks, but every four feet up is a wood stud in, in the wall. In the wall. That's still there? Yeah, and everything is dry completely. That's where you want to put the RH temperature data logger and, and watch the wood to make sure it stays dry in the worst location you can find that might get wet. I thought that only happened in Maine. I get UPSs on everything. I'll uninterruptible power supplies. No, you were talking about how you use power to, um, with a different way to get the Oh, oh. What, what I found, we have a digital, con GDC direct digital controls air handler in the building. Originally set up with four tons of cooling, two, two, two ton units and three zones and VAV and all that. If I just let that run in July and August, the way it was originally set up, I'd never get to net zero. What I did, the, the geothermal retrofit uses three and a half gallons of well water dumps it under the building, it goes back to the earth. If I shut off the main hair handler and run the geothermal retrofit, which has its own 800 CFM blower in it, and back distribute the air through the return air system in the building, I can easily get to net zero because geothermal air conditioning is so much more efficient than conventional air conditioning. Geothermal air conditioning, I'm trying to make 55 degree air from 55 degree water. The coefficient of performance of doing that is unbelievable. You know, you get an EER of 50 or something, whereas a regular air conditioner, the best you're going to get is what, maybe 13 uh, EER. So, by doing that, we went net positive. Um, so, if 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 I have to, if I got to design somebody's net zero building. Once you've covered the roof with PV, what do you got left? You know, the answer to me would be go to think about geothermal air conditioning if it's got to be air conditioned. All right, great diversion. Replacing an atmospheric vented natural draft furnace or boiler. What's that all about? What's a natural draft furnace or boiler? You guys had heating technology in any way? Wes, should they know what a natural draft boiler is? Or you guys furnace? Got we got heating in. Yeah. We're doing that. Yes, no? We have okay. So nat natural draft is there's a chimney and somewhere between the chimney and the burner is a hole. And when the chimney gets too hot, the chimney sucks some of its air from the room. Because if you didn't have that vent, when the chimney gets real hot, it would suck the heat right out of the boiler or furnace and never get it into the house. That's the, same, that's the air gap on top of the hot water heater that if the chimney's cold, the air comes down the chimney and out the air gap. When I get rid of one of those, essentially that was a natural draft exhaust fan in the basement forever, I'm usually moving around 50 CFM of air up the chimney exhausting and ventilating the basement. The minute I get rid of that, when I put in sealed combustion, pipe in, pipe out, <laughs> exhaust fan in the basement's gone. So that's the issue with 
furnace replacement. It, things that might improve indoor air quality include air sealing, um, which I to get rid of ice dams. Ice dams pretty much on homes are caused from air leaks. You could talk about heat leakage, but in general, if you get ice dams, it's because you got holes between the living space and the attic. And if you air seal those holes, you go probably reduce the heat flow in the attic by 50% just from air sealing the holes, some cases 400%. So you'd expect good weatherization to reduce ice dams on a house or eliminate them. Um, air sealing between the attached garage and the house so that air can't move from the garage to the house definitely ought to improve indoor air quality. If you measure volatile organic chemicals in a home, they usually come from either funny hobbies in the basement, an attached garage, or somebody storing a lawnmower in the house because the gasoline comes out of the lawnmower and ends up inside the house. So VOCs usually come from garages. A real debatable issue in all this weatherization stuff is if, if you've made the garage vent less because it's not going into the house and the kids play in the garage should you do something to the garage and the current guidance for energy star homes is put an exhaust fan in the garage so if someone's out there doing stuff you can actually pull air through the garage and give them some reasonably healthy air and replacing an atmosphere vented draft furnace probably reduces any backdrafting. It turns out an awful lot of furnaces backdraft. They only, only backdraft for a couple of minutes, but that's still combustion fumes in your house. So getting rid of all that is probably a good thing. So the protocol that's been developed that's completely voluntary by the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council. Maine Indoor Air Quality Council which is an educational organization, hired Terry Brennan and I to develop and train a protocol for weatherization crews. Figure out there was no federal protocol a year ago. It wasn't even being discussed that we knew of a year ago. So Terry and I met and worked together to figure out if you had to train a weatherization crew, what would you do? So this is the laundry list of materials that we came up with and we had to come up with guidance for all these materials. So the topics are asbestos, which we already know is a wonderful fiber, but it's not good to breathe it. It's illegal to expose people to it. Environmental tobacco smoke is actually recently added because we know secondhand smoke isn't good for kids. It's one thing for a parent to decide to smoke. It's another thing to expose kids to it. Garage pollutants, lead, moisture. Lead, where would the lead come from? Paint. Paint. It used to be from gasoline. The, the worst way to inhale or be exposed to lead is to have it bound to an organic chemical. So if you'd like to hurt somebody with lead, dilute it in gasoline and then give it to them because it ends up stored in your fat layers where it then eventually, or bones, and then it eventually comes out later. So leaded gasoline is a real nasty which is the main reason they got rid of it. Of course, the lead was a lubricant in the valves for the engines. They had to come up with new valve drains that wouldn't burn up when you took the lead out of the gas. And the other way to get lead into people is add it to, to paint, to oil-based paint, and then grind up the paint and let them breathe it or turn it to chips and, and let kids play in it. So, Lead pipes aren't bad unless the water is real acidic. Lead pipe is what people lived with for years. Unless the water was acidic, it wasn't a health risk. But add it to paint, add it to gasoline, and you got a hell of a health risk. Moisture is only an issue because it grow, if there's enough of it, things grow. Ozone is what you get from electric arcs. It's a regulated pollutant because it's probably one of the best ways to kill human lung tissue. Breathe in ozone and watch your lung tissue die is the way it works. Um, ozone's great for altering odors. So there are people who bring in ozone generators to get rid of smoke odors. Used car salespeople use them all the time to get rid of 
tobacco smoke odors in cars. Great for changing odors, but don't have a person there. It's regulated at very low levels because it's so nasty to breathe. Um, it's sort of like breathing bleach. Bleach is an oxidizer, ozone's an oxidizer. Uh, and you say, well, I use, a dro I use eight drops of bleach per gallon of water to kill bacteria so I can drink the water. But you're not breathing it. Your gut's a lot more robust than the tissue in your lungs. We already talked about pests. We already talked a little about radon. Yep. Uh, can you get rid of radon? Radon's the easiest pollutant to keep out of your house. You can't get rid of it. Right. It's the easiest to keep out by pulling a slight suction onto your concrete floor and, and the suction pulls the radon and blows it outside where it would have gone anyways if you didn't put your house there. But radon as a material is hard to get rid of. It's pretty much inert. So it absorbs up into the concrete? Is that how it works and then radiates out? No. This board fair game? No, um, use those. <clears throat> Basement, right? Footer, footer, concrete slab. Radon's here trying to get into your house. The only way I can stop that radon, I can never perfectly seal this. I can grind out all the cracks, fill them with urethane goo, etc., but I'm going to miss something. So the only way to get radon out of an existing house is you bore a hole through the floor, usually four inches in diameter. You take out a five-gallon pail of dirt in here. If you're uncomfortable leaving it out, you put three quarter inch stone back in, but you don't, usually you can just leave it out. And then you put on a pipe with a fan up on some place out of the living space of the house to create a tiny suction under the slab. So any, if I create a, I'm talking 10 Pascal suction. A Pascal is 0.04 inches of water or four gnat farts. So I create a tiny suction under here, and what that does is any place there's a crack in the concrete, air goes from the house into the ground instead of from the ground into the house. As long as this is gravel, coarse sand, crushed rock, anything other than hard packed um, hard pan. I can do this. If it's crushed rock, I only need one hole. If it's hard packed sand, I may need two holes through and I, you know, run this up and put it into a manifold so I'm sucking with one fan to more than one. Th these are called drops. Okay. And, the, and you can't do this in New England unless you're licensed if you're doing it for someone else. You can do it in your own home for yourself. But if you're going to do it for someone else, you have to be a licensed radon contractor. Because the most important thing of doing all this is wherever you dump this, it shall not come back into your house. If you dump it beside a window, let's collect all the radon under the house, blow it out, and have it come back in the window. So that, that's the theory on radon. And what if it's a dirt floor? Dirt floors are actually pretty amazing. Dirt floors are actually, relatively speaking, real easy with one exception. Rubble foundation, right? Okay. If this is dirt, the radon's freely going to come in. Okay. If if I don't really care what I use this for, the, the simplest thing that works the best is I get some single part squirt foam, either white or black, whatever color you choose, and wherever this foundation is above grade, I use squirt foam to, to block the biggest holes. 
Then, then I go buy flame rated poly, which is the stuff they put on scaffolding when people are working on scaffolding. It's fiberglass reinforced poly that if I put a torch to it doesn't burn, turns the BBs. And I take that material and I anchor it to the sill. I create this huge baggie inside, you know, and if, if water is going to still come in here, I need to put in some kind of drain to let the water out. And, and I just put a perforated pipe under here, four inch drain pipe, you know, the black stuff, onto a T and run that up to my fan. It's actually cheaper than dealing with concrete. Um, I just have to pay for the poly. But, so it's, if you've seriously got radon, that's the only easy way to fix a dirt floor rubble foundation. It's a little weird, but it works very nicely to keep out radon. And at that point, the real issue is, can I air seal above grade here enough that when the wind's blowing real hard, it doesn't, it doesn't turn this into a balloon? You know? uh, I mean, that's the real issue. I, I need to air seal up in here to help this work better for a negative pressure, but I also need to air seal enough up in here that the wind blowing at 30 miles an hour doesn't turn this into a big balloon in the side of my basement. Great, great questions. By the way, so for any other below ground contaminants, oil, dry cleaning fluid, whatever your neighbor dumped in the ground, this works for all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so in a regular home that's solid concrete, you can usually fix radon. You can hire a contractor and get it done usually for two grand or less. There aren't too many other defects in a home you can fix for two grand or less. You know, maybe a downdrafting of a furnace, but when someone screws up the wall system and the wall's rotting away, usually you aren't gonna fix it for two grand. It's gonna be a hell of a lot more than that to rebuild the wall. Um, so there's actually protocols for all these items. Home safety and worker safety is a new one. Worker safety, the most important part about worker safety is, is confined space behavior. If you're in an attic alone or a crawl space alone and there's a hole this big to get out of, how do you make sure the person working in there, if they get injured, can get out and there's no hazardous material in there or they aren't gonna get electrocuted from hitting a bad junction box or something and how do you respond to all that? And the, and, Falls off of ladders is probably the other big one. And then what chemicals are you working with that you need to make sure you're safe from? Are the big issues with worker safety. Home safety was added because you got a weatherization crew in there. You got an 80 year old lady who's got an extension cord run across the living room floor. Somebody ought to probably think about slips and falls with this person who may just be oblivious or maybe someone ought to make sure the smoke detectors work. If you're in there and you got a, a, a marginally functional person and your goal is weatherization and you're, that, you're bright enough to do weatherization, maybe someone ought to be checking to see if the smoke detectors work. Or, and, and the current thinking is if there's any kind of combustion appliance in a home, the weatherization crew shall install a carbon monoxide monitor. And you can now get CO monitors with five-year batteries in them. So for at least five years, you potentially save someone's life from a malfunctioning combustion appliance. I mean, the, the body count right now in this country from accidental CO deaths is like 400 a year. So the problem hasn't gone away. Um, it's tough to kill yourself with a new car because there's not enough CO coming out of it. It's real easy to kill yourself with a poorly performing gas hot water heater, furnace, boiler, or the most popular way right now is with a, ge a generator in your garage during a power failure. You stick a generator in your garage, open the door, the power cord goes into the house, the fumes from the generator go into the house, fresh air is coming in the door, and there's three dead people the next day because 
you've started up a generator. Small engines are outrageous sources of CO. So the minute you put one running attached to your house, you're risking killing somebody. Um, okay, so let's go through some of this stuff. We'll take a break, what, about 2.30? Okay. Um, remember, you can, that website will get you a, a lot more detail than what we're going to cover today. The parallel program EPA is about to announce when all the Fed, uh, once all the federal agencies have blessed what's in here, it'll get put out for review by everybody. Um, and that's the title of it. And it's the books are already developed and basically say, you know, here's how you go look at something as an assessment. Here's the minimum thing you ought to be doing about it. And if you got enough money, here's the expanded action the weatherization crew should take. Cause DOE weatherization money historically can't address asbestos, mold, and things like that. So you'd have, as an agency, you'd have to figure out what money can I find to address those topics. Um, if you want more information, that's the website you can go to to learn more about the proposed government federal programs. Um, and the comment period on commenting on it by anybody will be sometime in November once it finally gets released. In theory, it was going to be released November 3rd. The last I heard was November 10th. After last night, I have no idea. Um, see, all the, current, all the current home programs are voluntary. This starts to get to regulatory. And there's lots of political discussions as to whether you should regulate my house or what I do in my house is my business. Um, the minute you're using federal or state money to alter a house, most people would assume it's the liability of that program to make sure you got a safe place as opposed to you doing something to your house on your own. Um, so that's part of all this. Part of all this concern is if I'm going to use state federal money to alter people's homes, do I need to make sure it's still a safe place to live? If they're doing it on their own, it's sort of them and the contractor who's responsible. I used to uh, live in Germany, and by law, when I lived in Germany, by law, you had to allow one time a year the I can only say the local chimney cleaner to come to clean the chimney. You had no choice; you had to pay him. And the same thing with the oil burner if you had oil or combustible gas, or whatever, in your house. By law, you had to let them in your house, they give you advance notice, but you had to pay them. Yeah, are you talking 150 bucks for the time you were there? Or? Yeah. Every time they came, it was probably like 150 bucks. Right. So there, there you got, I'm going to call it a, a regulatory public health norm that says we really don't want to keep kill people. Yeah. And we know that if you got an oil fired burner, if you don't clean it, it clogs up. I don't care how well it's tuned. If you got a gas fired unit, less likely to do that. But if the burner is out of adjustment and it's generating 300 parts per million CO instead of 50 parts per million CO, it doesn't take a lot of air at 300 parts per million CO to, to kill you. No, my point was you just didn't have a choice. I mean, you had to let right. the door. I mean, that kind of, I mean, I knew it was good, but this right. kind of irked me a little bit. Well, and we're not used to particularly being told what our private space needs to be, right. you know, to be safe. Right. That's those 400 people a year that died from CO, what their opinion would be of that, regulation. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's... Uh, the families are more. You, you can argue either way. Accidental deaths from CO poisoning are a tragedy. You know, particularly when someone around a generator trying to survive. You know, the wise ass comment is, well, you're reducing the folks that would do that, but. The Darwin you know. Awards. The, what? the Darwin Awards? Yeah, is that the person that, that kills themselves the most ridiculous way by accident? Well, essentially, taking themselves out of the gene pool, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So backdrafting, we already alluded to. Backdrafting is when, you know, particularly if, if this chimney gets cold that this one's attached to, when you fire up the gas or water heater, 
the cold air is coming down, coming out here, the fumes come up, they all come into the room. Uh, and this standardized testing for figuring out if that's going to happen, it's, all, it's, it's not necessarily simple to predict. In some ways, it's far easier to test than predict whether you're going to get back drafting. Um, BPI has a whole protocol. So anytime this comes up, BPI home audit section seven is what you go look at to figure out how to do the testing. <laughs> what do you think? Was that a serious case of spillage? Yeah. That's a real photo. That one's actually courtesy of Terry too. You know, the good and bad news is they got fumes, they didn't blow up the house, but they're probably not too far from making it hot enough for the gas line to go. Um, someone really screwed up. So there's all kinds of guys.